welcome to day four of our band books week library live stream my name is Catherine mowry i'm the teen services librarian at the fox lake district library here in fox lake illinois and i'm here with the super wonderful and accommodating shannon wheeler um, but before we get going i just want to give a special thank you to image comics the comic book legal defense fund and of course the graphic novels and comics round table of the american library association for putting all these wonderful live streams together uh, but before we get started again uh we were supposed to have charles soul with here here with us tonight but he couldn't be here so we were super lucky to have shannon wheeler who is the author of memoirs of a uh, <laughs> blanking. Very stable genius. Thank you. I read it <laughs> and I'm blanking on it. And uh, too much coffee man here with us tonight. And he was so generous and wonderful to, to be with here to be here with us this evening. So yeah. we're so happy. My pleasure. So thank you so much Shannon for, for being here and we're, we're so happy to speak with you. Um, just uh, just before we get started on our on our chat, um, we just wanted to let uh, to ask our audience uh, who, who you are. Do we have public librarians, school librarians, educators, comics enthusiasts, um, some mixture of one of those, someone else? Um, as you come into the chat room, if you could just let us know who you are, that would be really great. Um, and also, if you can just also let us know if any of you, if any of you had a challenge or a ban at your library, um, that would also be great. Um, and just so we can lay a base work, we just want to define challenged versus ban for the pur purpose of our discussion. Challenge is kind of the first step to becoming banned. Challenged is where someone comes into the library and says, I'm unhappy with this this book, this work being in, in the library, whether it's a public library, a school library, even a bookstore. Um, there are many reasons they could be unhappy about this work being in the library. It, it often is because there are you know, LGBT characters. There could be sex, violence, language, drug use. Um, they disagree with the viewpoints expressed in the book. Um, and then once they take the formal steps outlined in the library's policy to challenge that work presence in the library, usually uh, a library will have a form they can fill out detailing their, their reasons why they disagree with this work's presence in the library. And, um, that challenge goes to the governing board on the strategy, and if they decide to remove the work from the library, then the work goes and it becomes banned. Sometimes that happens, and sometimes it just stays in the challenge step, steps. So that's, uh, that's the main difference between challenged and banned and it is um, challenges and bans they are on the rise um, but it's still important to remember that the vast majority of challenges are not reported not we don't know about them the, the office of intellectual freedom doesn't ever receive a report so we, we never hear about them so if it happens in your library, contact the Office of the Intellectual Freedom so the stats can become, become improved. So let's talk to Shannon. <laughs> He's a fascinating character and he has an amazing body of work and we're really privileged to have him here tonight to speak with him. So Shannon, you could, you could tell us a little bit about some of your works. Um, What's your most recent work? Uh, my most recent work is the memoirs of a stable genius. And 
that is a collection of cartoons. So it's a number of short stories, single panel comics leading into. Uh, so my favorite one in there is the micro penis story, which is yeah, just. That was an amazing way to start that up. <laughs> I was reading it at the reference desk. I was like, oh my gosh, I should do this stuff. And seize this. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's a true story, and it actually is one that uh, really changed my life, and that's one reason I wanted to share that story is because I thought this might have some weight. And it's, I mean, the, the kidding aside, like it is, you know, a, a kind of a giggle thing about the, you know, the, the malady of a micro penis, but I think it's something that, it would be very difficult, is very difficult for people. And so it is a very serious topic, but I think a lot of times approaching a serious topic with a humorous or personal point of view is really, uh, really powerful. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Oh, wait, I missed that last one. What's that? I liked the resolution of the story in a way. <laughs> they turn out the way the uh, narrative yeah. thing it too. It, um, yeah, I mean, to, to, you know, ruin the story for people, it's basically, I went to camp and there was a guy who had a micro penis. And then one day I heard laughing coming from the shower and I thought they were making fun of him. When I went into, you know, try to defuse the situation or whatever, you know, like to, to defend him or see what was going on. Um, they were laughing, but he was laughing also, and it was commiserate. So they were they were being sympathetic and empathetic with him and his struggles. And they're saying, you know, like, oh, dude, that's just terrible. What are you going to do? And he's like, what can I do? And they're like, man, your life is going to be tough. He's like, yeah, I know. And they're like, oh, we're so sorry. And it was just like, it was yeah, it was a, it was really profound because I thought this is very much against what I was expecting. I was expecting conflict, and instead it was sympathy and support, and it just and then the the person who had the problem um, was dealing with it with this grace and dignity that that really surprised me. Also, I thought, okay, this guy who has something that's difficult, if he's dealing with it with that much. Um, grace and aplomb, then and, and I in my life, whatever problems I will have, I should at least try to have some kind of self-respect and dignity um, going through life. So that, that's, yeah, it was, a, to me, it was a, a really important story. And really, I, I don't know, I was just really happy to finally get it down on paper. Uh-huh. Ever read that? The, the yeah, it's it's a it's great. Yeah, yeah. I, I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of your other works that our readers might not be familiar with? Um in that book there's one about hanging out with John Lewis, the uh civil rights leader. Um there's also a lot of gag cartoons that I've done for the New Yorker, so just you know, silly little <laughs> yeah. jokes that I've done. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been nice. It's it's been a long career of drawing comics, and I've done some a lot of underground stuff. Like uh, the micro penis story is a little bit, you know, some edgy stuff, mm -hmm. and then New Yorkers cartoons, which are are kind of um, I guess they would be mainstream. Um, what's what's coming up next for you? Can you tell us anything? I know you, authors can't always tell. Tell uh, what's I'm the worst magician in the world. I'll say, oh, here's this little magic trick, and then I'll show you exactly the false bottom exactly where the rabbit comes from. So, I, yeah, <laughs> more than happy to talk about stuff. Um, I'm working on a memoir. It is about the '60s and uh, hippie culture leading into the 70s. Um, when I was a kid, my mom took us to see Jim Jones. So I have these memories of Jim Jones. My father was a hippie and had a commune. 
So I have memories of communal living. When I was in college, I rented a, a house from um, uh, Huey Newton, who is a leader of the Black Panther. So I've got these kind of three different versions of the 60s, you know, hippies, Jim Jones, and Black Panthers. And then, so it's it's a memoir, but it's more about other people, really about myself. My life is pretty boring. But I want to touch on these different views of what people are doing in terms of personal liberty, trying to change the culture. It was three groups that were actively trying to say, hey, our culture, we don't like our culture, we want to change it. And so this idea of how do you change culture and, and these three different ways of doing it. Uh, there's a question from the chat asking if, if the memoir is going to touch on any of the revolutionary movements in the 70s, and if get more directly revolutionary. If it's going to touch on the, what's that? you got to speak into the speaker. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying. If, right. is, the, is the memoir going to touch on any of the revolutionary actions of the 70s when the movement began to get more directly revolutionary? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go too deep into it, um, but I am going to talk about what their goals were and what the Black Panthers, there, there's kind of these two um, major aspects of it. One of them was very community oriented, free lunches, education. And then another side had to do with um, the right to bear arms and stopping police violence against black people. And then some of that is very violent. And uh, and then other parts of it were were not violent. It was had to do with just passive resistance. And so yeah, I'm I'm going to touch on that. Uh, it's a conflict, so it's not. Yeah, yeah. And also, my point of view on things tends to be a little bit. You know, I, I, I like the irony. In the, you know. That's why people like your books. <laughs> that's, that's good. Um, I hope so. I hope I have a few insights. It was interesting, you know, that I was there in uh, Oakland, Berkeley, and, you know, I have these, I have memories of, um, of Huey Newton and dealing with him directly. And as my, my stepfather gave me advice when dealing with Huey Newton, and uh, it was it was uh, hey, on time. Yeah, I, I saw him when I was in college. Fascinating. Sounds like you're the you're the perfect person to write that. <laughs> that's, there. that's what that's what we need primary sources. Well, yeah, and it, it, I'm very much an outsider in terms of you know I wasn't part of the movement or anything like that, um, but. Yeah, and I was renting in the 80s, so it was this, it's an odd transition from the revolution of the 70s into kind of the survival aspect of the 80s and trying to live in the Bay Area. But hopefully I'll have something, you know, it's something that we're still kind of digesting as a culture and, and processing. So hopefully I'll have one or two insights to, to, add, to the, add to the mix. Sounds, sounds like it. Um. I know there's there's been so many books coming out on that time period, and it will it'll be great to see something graphic. And I I, I can't wait to read it. Um, in a perfect world, uh, where would you have this this book you're talking about, or or any of your books show in a library? Uh, would you want them in nonfiction or biography, or maybe in a separate graphic novel section? Um, maybe different, maybe different books of yours would go in different spots. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I've, I've really struggled with how to, when, when I've done things in Hollywood or whatever, they've said, you know, who does this appeal to? What are you doing? And I know it's a trope, but to say, I'm really writing this for myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's like the micro penis story. I don't know who. <laughs> it was purely for myself. I mean, it was purely like I, I liked it, and it's not graphic. It's not no, period. Not. Um, I mean, I could, I could see teens who would relate to that story. I yeah, I think one in a hundred. Well, no, I. <laughs> 
creating some empathy and sympathy for people that are that have that problem is, I think, really important. And and it's something that's not talked about. And what was interesting writing that story is the amount of work that went into avoiding uh, puns and cliches yeah. and these sort of simple jokes, or like the low hanging fruit of because it's so hard to culture to make fun of people with a malady. Um, especially something like that, and we haven't come to terms with it yet. So that's why I thought it was kind of an important one to write. I think you did it very well. Thank you. You're dope. I uh, have a little segue story about where your books should be sold in a library. We yeah. actually had a, a patron um, question why this book of yours was shelved. <laughs> in the 900s rather than in our the humor section mm -hmm. <laughs> um, said, your book would be funny if it weren't true that's what he said yeah and so she actually spoke with our director about it and um it you can see it it remains in the 900s i so, love it um and, and I read the book, and it's it's not funny. <laughs> I mean, some of the, the 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 illustrations are amusing, but if you read the tweets, I mean, these are these are the actual tweets. I don't think it's funny. This is this is history. It is history, and a lot of them are being deleted. Um, and edited, and so there is something that's very significant and important about saying, "Hey, this is um, this should be recorded. It should be the hypocrisy that swings back around, and the contradictions and the false promises." Um, I think I think it is important to, to record that. And, it, and it's also important when you have like a, a patron challenge or question that you look at, at the book as a whole because. There's a, there's a very nice foreword from, from you explaining the intent. Then there's a very nice uh, biography at the end, and a little more. Oh, or where people can go to find more of these tweets. Oh, look at the book as a whole, why not just open one page and see? Um, Women in, in bathing suits. Yeah, that's the, the um, from the uh, beauty pageant when yeah, he, uh, uh, and he was talking about how much he wanted to be a friend and the Russia connections, which I think are really significant. And going back and, and saying this is what was said by Trump, um, Trump uh, Jr., um, all those things, I think it's really uh, significant. And, and and I guess it's going to be used as evidence at some point as we move forward and say what are its connections here they are, but um, yeah, and it's educational too. It shows like the history of it. Um, the evolution is interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's showing how social media is just part of our history now. So it's that, I was so excited when I saw I was talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what's interesting is that that's a book where, you know, it's co-written, it's me and Trump uh, writing together, <laughs> which is, I didn't really think about that until after it was going to press, and I was like, oh, this is, I'm kind of a co-author. <laughs> this is an interesting, interesting take. Somehow, I think he'll, he'll pass that up. <laughs> I would love to have to write a royalty check to him. That, that would be <laughs> Uh, let's see, this, there's another question from the chat. How do you feel about books that come up to be challenged or banned because of language or concepts that may have been part of the vernacular at the time it was written, but are no longer part of how we talk to each other as a society? I am thinking of some Mark Twain stuff in particular. That's a super difficult question. Yeah, as educators, a friend of mine that's a teacher, he said, 
the way that I don't think there's a single approach to say this is a this is the single way to deal with this. Um, off, or off. But my friend that's a teacher, he said that um, when he had people of color in his class, he would have a discussion at the beginning and say, if anybody is uncomfortable with this, please talk to me about this and we'll work to work, work around in order to create a, a uh, because you don't want anybody feeling bad or feeling uncomfortable. And the point of it is education. Um, understanding context is incredibly important for any work. And yeah, is, is something illustrating a situation or is it endorsing a situation? I mean, with, with Mark Twain, I feel like it's, um, he's illustrating, he's trying to, to say this is what was around him at the time. Um, whereas something like Birth of a Nation is propaganda where it's trying to promote something that, um, which again, I think is really important to see and understand, but giving context of what is the point of this artwork and talking about it as an aspect. But again, there's no single solution. It's a really, it's a, that's a super, super difficult question. Actually, that's, that's why those, those books keep coming up as being challenged um, for our members and our audiences that she thinks the language has a place in history and it's our duty as educators to preserve the right to access such things. Otherwise, there's no difference between banning now offensive concepts or things we just don't like that were written more recently. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I also feel that understanding our history and a lot of it is people coming to terms with that, I think is really important. And, and as long as it's not used to promote something that's really negative, but as a way to understand something negative, I think that it's that's significant. Um, but again, if you have a classroom situation and people are feeling really uncomfortable because of the material, that's something that that that's a special context and a special situation that you have to really figure out how to work around. It could certainly happen in a classroom for any number of reasons other than offensive language in a, in a novel you're reading. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, interesting. Also, now we're entering the internet age where there's the culture that you can find anything and everything on the internet. And, and so this notion of editing, um, it, it, the, the community standards are, are changing, the language is changing, um, images are changing. It's, I, I don't think we quite, we're just starting to get Gener a generation that is coming of age that was raised with an internet access. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I think that's going to have a profound effect on our culture. It's going to be interesting to see. <laughs> now that I'm older, too, I think horrified is the word that I have. But yeah, it is it's interesting. That, you know. I'm sure. So, what, going back to comics, um, what was that like when you were growing up? Were they seen <laughs> good, bad? Um, I know when I was growing up, um, my siblings and I weren't really into comics. I don't remember seeing comics at the library. This was like in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. I, don't, you know, I really only got into comics as a librarian. I, I don't know what it was like for you. Yeah, I didn't have them in the library at all. And my main exposure as a child was newspaper comics. Mm -hmm, definitely me too. Reading Garfield and just thinking Garfield was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Um, and then I was seven or eight. I don't know how old I was. And it, it was actually the comics in the newspaper that inspired me to learn how to read. It made me, like, I would read the pictures and I could kind of figure out the story, but I would see the words and I would, I just had this overwhelming desire to understand what these animals and people are saying. Uh, so it really pushed me to read early. And, but it was, it was when I was, uh, I don't know, first or second grade that I came across a copy of Africa's Cat, which is an underground comic. And to go from Garfield to, you know, this mainstream, you know, every Monday there's an I hate Monday joke to, <laughs> 
you know, this underground outrageous comic that had absolutely no rules to it. Um, it was it was mind blowing as a kid, and that's it was exposure to this thing that that was completely free that made me feel like oh, this is an art form that I really want to jump into, and I I wanted I liked it, and I wanted to do it, and that's made me want to draw and read and. Has exploded and developed, and it's it's just wonderful that we're able to have all these comics in the library for the for the kids and teens to come into, and they're able to just sit in the library and read comics all day. I'm thrilled that I'm able to facilitate that for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is amazing. It's really great. I mean, it it it, it inspired me, and hopefully, it'll inspire other kids and to to want to write a lot and think and um, have a sense of humor yeah. and and also see a lot of things um, that that they wouldn't otherwise see like, like the March comic book and seeing like okay this is civil rights and um, you know the LGBT stuff where it's like okay there's other lifestyles that are available to not feel guilty um, about themselves and what they're trying to, how they're living. I think that's really important. Yeah, we, we don't just have comics in the, in the comics section. There's there's comics in, in every part of the library, you know, all throughout the nonfiction, adult, children, teens. It's it's so wonderful. And Love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, as I don't know, maybe it's because Comics have exploded so much, but at, now we we see comics on it's taking up a, a lot of spots on these uh, Office of Intellectual Freedom top ten lists every year. They 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 get challenged and and banned more often. Um, people people often have a problem with comics, or they they do have that traditional view of comics is see, being seen as low brow. Um, what, why do you think that is? What, why, why do you think people often have a problem with comics? They're, they're so great. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, they, they are low brow. They're, I mean, they're low brow and they're high brow and they're mid brow. And, uh, but there is an accessibility to them where we, we have this vestige of intellectualism where it's got to be inaccessible to be intelligent. And something like a comic, you can read the pictures and understand the story to it. Um, you can, and for me, it inspired me to learn how to read. So I, I am very beholding to comics in that form. Um, but yeah, it operates on so many levels. Uh, I can, you know, yeah. I, and for me, like, I love it when comics are dumb, so I can, and and uh, to say like, uh, my mom was telling me that when she was a, a girl that in school that she'd always get the classics illustrated and read the comic books instead of the, instead of the novels. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, when they were coming out in the 50s and the 60s, the audience, there's, they were meant to be disposable. It was intended as pulp fiction, oh. something that you would read and throw away, which is in part why a lot of those comics are, are worth something now, because everybody did throw them away. But they were printed on the cheapest paper possible, and they were put out every every month, and um, and they pandered. You know, there there's definitely you know they're a pandering medium, so. And it's still, that's still kind of the case, you know, which is good and bad, I think. Mostly good. I really like comics. <laughs> it's, it's just like fiction. There's all kinds of fiction. There's all kinds of fiction. Um, do you have any favorite band comic? Um, well, Bone is a comic that I like quite a bit. Bone and, is wonderful. Yeah. Um, when I was getting kids to, to learn how to read, I uh, got a copy of Bone from Jeff to give to them, and they 
they've just trashed it. They they read through it. I mean, that was 15 years ago, but they read it. And and the pride that they had, because it's such a, a giant um, volume, that when they got to the end and read it, they felt like they really accomplished something. And so it was, it was, it was great. It was really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so that one, just in part because it, it really helped my kids a lot. They liked it. I have a soft spot in my heart for it. Every every library I've worked at, Bo has always been flying off the shelf. You always place it. It's it's always super popular. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so one thing we we haven't uh, discussed is the issue of gatekeeping. Uh huh. Uh, which where um, the issue is is kind of um, kind of what librarians do. They have to decide what books go into the library. So um, you know, um, <laughs> this chat. There's some issues in the chat. Um, okay. So. As librarians, we have to look at um, not personal feelings as whether or not this is a, is, a, is appropriate, um, whether or not we disagree with um, the, uh, the, the, the viewpoints, whether or not there's explicit content, whether or not there's anything like that. We have to look at the world as a whole. Does this, um, does this work fit within the library's collective development policy. Um, those are the things we should uh, we should be looking for, looking for when we're when we're picking out books for our collection. And sometimes it, it can be difficult to uh, our, our personal feelings can get in the way and we maybe buy things that we like um, or Oh, I think this book is stupid. I'm not going to buy it for the library. <laughs> this can be a real issue with um, banning books because, you know, often the books don't even get to the library to be banned and challenged in the first place. So, um, and this is there's no way to report this or get any kind of statistics on this. This is an issue that is uh, can be problematic. Yeah, there's just no way to there any kind of information on it. Um, but librarians just have to care. We try to get uh, the best collection we have. Um, it looks like we've got a question from the chat. Um, didn't know you grew up around Berkeley. Awesome. And you did a lot of your TNCM art. There. Were there local San Francisco Bay artists or things going on in the underground that inspired you as a kid? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, there was a, uh, in fifth grade, uh, Michael Gilbert was teaching an uh, underground cartooning class in San Francisco. And maybe it was even fourth grade. Or I, I mean, it was, it was for adults, but my mom would drive us over to the city because she knew I was interested in comics. And Michael T. Gilbert, he did a comic book called Mr. Monster and did a lot of underground stuff. Um, and that's where he said, this is how to do comics. This is how to do storytelling. Um, here are some artistic tricks on, on how to do stippling, how to do, uh, how to use Zipatone. Um, Here's how a color process works. I mean, it was, it was eye-opening for me. But I, I really saw comics as magic because I thought, how do you have these single panels put one next to another, and then you're creating this time flow? And so, yeah, Michael T. Gilbert connection was a big point for me. Um, the, we had the Fat for the Cat because um turned out that Gilbert Shelton was a friend of our family, a friend of my aunts and uncles in Austin, Texas. And so that's, we had a bunch of these underground comments of me sort of finding that tucked away on the bookshelf. 
open that up. So that was, that's more the Texas underground than the Bay Area. Going to comic conventions as a kid, uh, I just, that's where I was really dove into it. And we'd talk to the artists there. And a lot of the one-off meetings where they would say, this is how I do it. And they would do drawings for me. It was, yeah. So the, having that, that vibrant culture really made a, a big difference. Issue I'm referring to. Which one is that again? Your sound cut out. I'm, uh oh, we've got our doppelganger here. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry with all these sound issues. This is not a good computer. Um, yes, they wanted to add Watchmen in their school library, but that was a problem because of uh, Mr. Manhattan's big dick. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering how you were going to phrase that. That's <laughs> I didn't. I did not see that one coming. That's great. But I can see why that would be an issue in a school. Um, <laughs> um, but you know that uh, the person mentioned what kind of kind of school it would be. I, I think it might be okay in a university library, but in a high school, it. And on your community, blue phallus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have it here here at my library on our band books week display, a nice big annotated edition. Oh. Yeah, and that's an interesting book because, I mean, for me, I, I feel like that's a very, he was portrayed, it's a very unsexual. Uh, and and like, violence in that book is what I find really disturbing and problematic. Yeah, it's one of the darkest uh, graphic novels. And so if I were going to object to it, that's how I would. Um, but as an educational tool, I think it, it's it, it's so well written. And a lot of times if you're able to give context to um, the kids and say, you know, OK, they're here they are reading this book and talk to them about okay, this is what this is referencing. Or this is what this is about or this is why the violence is in there in this way um, to shoot to symbolize this or to mean that or to um, so yeah that's I think that is I mean that's a complicated book and it's a, I I would tend to think that's a little bit more of an adult but not because of the schlong but no, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's, there's just a lot there that's why it has an annotated edition yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um how do you feel about the overwhelming concern about sexuality that doesn't seem to be reflected in the same way when it comes to violence in the United States? That we don't seem to care as much about killing as we do about nudity, for example? Yeah, you can bear, um, you can bear arms, but you can bear breasts, is that <laughs> joke from the 70s or 80s or something. Um, yeah, on a personal level, I feel like that's like the violence and the, the glorification of violence really bothers me. And that's a personal thing. Whereas the sexuality, if it's healthy sex, I think that's that's very reasonable. And, and um, as long as it's not gratuitous, um, I tend to be, I mean, even on the, the dirty comics that I've done, I, I tend to be very kind of gentle with my stuff. Um, but then again, I also really appreciate something like the Checker Demon or Robert Crumb stuff um, or Eileen Crumb stuff. I mean, that, I don't know. I, yeah, the, the violence bothers me a lot more than sex or nudity. Nudity is like, you know, we're, it, that doesn't bother me at all. I, I agree. Um, <laughs> Image Comics notes that they worked in a library where Watchmen ended up getting shelved in the children's section due to a cataloging error. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fun. Yeah, and I, I, 
as a as a kid, I mean, times are changing in that once children have access to the internet, then um, and in a way, teaching them it's it's it, it, how do you educate kids and to say like, okay, here is unhealthy healthy imagery, and here's how to deal with it. I think a lot of it has education is my is my thoughts on it. follow-up to that, one of our, our commenters uh, asks, what about substance use? Do you find that, depictions of substance use, do you find that bothersome? Oh, that's a good question. I thought so too. <laughs> <laughs> I know that in the 80s, head shops were selling Fabulous Furry Free Feathers comics, and that enabled, and, and a lot of the underground comics were being sold through head shops. So, late 70s or early 80s they had they were comics underground comics just had this uh way to sell a ton and i think i want to say great i'm not sure who but they passed something saying hey you can't sell underground comics in a head shop along with boxes because their rationale was that it was uh having an instruction manual for drug use and the water pipes you know, for tobacco use only, supposedly, but they're saying this is showing drug. Um, I don't know. Again, you know, like the legalization of marijuana, um, the accessibility to drugs. Again, I think education is so important and and dealing with people on a, on a one. So for me, like when I was reading the underground comics when I was a kid, it just was silly to me, and I didn't see it as... A, a glorification. I just thought it was being silly and I thought it was funny. And um, so on a personal level, I don't see it has a, having a, a super negative impact, but I could be, somebody could argue with me on that point and I would go, oh yeah, that's it. So I'm, I'm not like part of that rule at all. Yeah, I could see that. It, it's interesting though. I mean, it, that's something that, um, um, that's really, yeah, it's it's a really good point. Um, yeah. The drug use in the Freak Brothers is funny as hell, though, I'll say that. <laughs> I'm sure it depends on the context. <laughs> as everything does. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, can you tell us um, what is your favorite thing out of all your vast catalog of work that you've ever worked on? Um, well, I'm, Memoirs of a State of Virginia, that book is my most recent. So that, like that to me is still warm in my heart. I feel like this has some of my best work. Um, I worked with Mark Russell on a book called God is Disappointed in You, where we rewrote the Bible cartoons for it. Um, that one I'm very proud of as well. And again, education. I mean, like for me, we're, I wanted to work on that Bible book because I wanted to learn about the Bible. And we took it seriously. It's a humorous book, but we, we took it seriously in trying to say what is the message of... Mm -hmm. um, you know, Leviticus, like what is Leviticus about? And then, you know, really trying to get to the nut of what each book is about and then rewrite it, shorten it, do some funny cartoons. Um, and basically, you know, Leviticus is a bunch of rules. And so anybody that's quoting Leviticus is kind of uptight and a jerk. Uh, but, it's, you know, all the Jesus stuff is pretty loving and, and good. it was good. It was a, that, that book I'm really, really proud of. Where would you want that one cataloged in the world? <laughs> With the Bibles. You know, I kind of feel like at first I was thinking like, oh, this is another interpretation. I thought, no, this is basically it's a translation. It's there's the King James translation. There's a modern English translation. This is, it's, uh, I bought an Ebonics version of the Bible. That's great. But this is in many ways just another translation of the Bible. Although, maybe... Somebody asked Mark, 
they were thinking of buying it for their kid and they said would this book be appropriate for children to read and and he said well it's based on the bible so <laughs> there's a lot of sex and violence and you know so nice stuff in there. Patricide and, uh, and, and fantasize. When it when it with pictures. <laughs> oh no, all the pictures are are very clean and I again I'm I'm when all said and done I'm pretty uptight about all that. That's all pretty silly and <laughs> yeah. Everybody's cute and kind of love it, you know. Yeah. Well that that sounds fun. I'll have to check that one out. So, we have some people who joined us kind of late. I don't think they answered my poll about whether are you guys public librarians, school librarians, educators. Tell us a little about yourself so we can know who's tuning in. Um, it's great to see people active in the chat. Come, ask us questions. So, we have this wonderful author mind here you guys have a chance to ask him some questions so let's get these questions in um uh, this i think was a question for for charles asking about whether curse words has been banned or challenged anywhere um i haven't heard of it being banned or challenged i've looked over these lists i think if it has it's it's one of those silent majority that hasn't been reported. Have you read curse words? Yeah, I wouldn't know. Um, that definitely Charles would have, uh, I mean, he's tracking that stuff really closely. Yeah, it, um, has, it has not been, but I, I would think as long as, you know, you got a shelf thing, you got to buy things for your appropriate audience you know shelve it with your adult comics and, and that that'll probably nip a lot of them in the bud <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun series um yeah guys are you librarians are you comic comics enthusiasts are you educators um uh nothing really mattress likes to keep track of how many banned books she's read. She's up to about 160. Wow. Awesome. I think you uh, I think you should keep going with that. I are these books that are actually banned or are these books that are challenged? That's pretty great. Um do you have any stories for us, Charles, about scary teacher librarian interactions? <laughs> Um, about your, your comic education, comic life, any uh, teacher librarian stories you want to share with us? You, Shannon. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have, I mean, on a, on a personal level, like coming across comics as a kid and, and the education that it gave me. Uh, or good stories was was really powerful and really good. like it it really did inspire me to to learn how to read and i see that as a um, real positive potential for for other kids and one one real solid of comics when my kids were little before they could read words i said hey you know here read some comics and they said, oh we can't read they're twins. And I said, no, you can read. You just can't read the words yet. So they would just read the pictures. And that, um, I gave them some Sergio Aragones comics that were all silent. And then they would just read, sit and read the comics. And, and they realized that they could read them. And it was just a, uh, a nice moment. But yeah, that, um, I mean, I see the libraries having that potential um, with kids. Yeah, definitely. I've seen that all. All the time. Um, what are your son's favorite comics? <laughs> Nowadays, uh, they yeah, they, 
Watchmen they liked a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Unflattening is a, is a book that we picked up recently. And that one I liked a lot. It's getting a little bit more into metaphysical uh, philosophy stuff about the meaning of uh, the nature of reality and all that. They're, they're hitting 20 now, so they're getting more interested in, um, in abstract ideas more. Um, they like Bean World, they like quite a bit. Um, that one's been really, that was a really nice read when they were, when they were younger. Um, Have you seen any kind of change, growth, acceptance in, uh, in the level of, in, in how indie comics are accepted by uh, educators and librarians over the years? Oh, a complete revolution. I never saw this. And I never anticipated this. It was very marginalized as a kid, and I never thought it would uh, move into being an educational tool. I just thought, oh, comics are this thing that are off to the side, and they've been incorporated. Uh, uh, Larry Gonick did a lot of uh, history of the universe, uh, history of the United States. He he, he was very early in in pushing comics as a potential education. Cool. Um, but it's just amazing. I mean, that, I'm really thankful for that, that he wrote that, that road. But then, you know, like March, um, there's one that, that gives you this really accessible way to understand um, the power of the, the Nate Powell's illustrations are just, um, you know, he's just a major talent to be able to pull that off. So emotional, so real. I'm, I'm thrilled every time I see it on the return cart. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, I think I missed the most important question. Um, why do you think intellectual freedom and creative expression are so important? Oh, I, it just doesn't occur to me to, to think any other way. I can. Yeah. I mean, for me, it just made me happy. I guess it just has to do with happiness when all said and done. For me, like growing up, when I started reading, you know, Fat Freddy's Cat, it just made me happy. And even now, when I get a comic I'm really enjoying, it just, yeah, it's just happiness. I don't know. I don't know any other way to say it. Yeah, I, I feel the same way with my huge grocery bag full of graphic novels that I'm going to sit and <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is, Do you think there's anything about the current climate now that has changed why it's either more important, less important, changed the level of importance in any way? I, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, for me, I did the Trump book because I was trying to process I was very upset when, when Trump was elected. I'm very much a lefty. Um, and it, it was upsetting emotionally. And, and it was a way on a personal level to process it and deal with it. Um, so hopefully that translates up to people reading the book and saying, and helping other people like, okay, I can have a better handle on what we're doing. Um, something like the, the micro penis story, I think that's really important to say, you know, culturally, if we're making fun of people with that to say, hey, this is a, a, a difficult aspect of one's life that you have to deal with. So disarming bullies, I think, and if we're having a culture of bullies and um, a lack of acceptance in other people's issues, then yeah, having the freedom and uh, literary material to say, you know, hey, it's okay to have problems and and identifying the bully and categorizing it and saying, yeah, this is bad behavior. And so it's a way to, to create more equality and acceptance. Wonderful. I, that's, I couldn't say it better myself. Um, <laughs> In closing, because um, we're, we're coming up on seven, um, is there anything else you wanted to mention <laughs> to the internet um, about your, your 
works, you know, anything else you want to let us know about what's in the, what's in the, the queue? Um, let's see, possibly being another Too Much Coffee Man book. Got the memoir book going, and I'm putting together another book of old collected cartoons. Um, but you know, support your support your artists. We're all struggling, and it's a it's a tough path to choose to say, oh, I'm gonna be a creator, and um, yeah. So, so you know, buy a copy of Mark, or reading it is is also just a way to support it. So uh, yeah, support your local artists. knows how to report the uh, the challenges that may come your way. The office of the ALA Office of Intellectual Freedom provides confidential support to anyone undergoing a challenge or a ban. Support can come in the form of letters, book reviews, resources, talking points, emotional support, you name it. Um, they, the ALA has an online form that you can use to report censorship or they have an 1-800 number, which is 1-800-545-243, extension 4226. And if you are experiencing uh, challenges in the, for, to a comic, uh, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund is also there. Their number that you can use to report challenges is 1-800-99-CBLDF, or you can email them at info at cbldf.org. And both organizations are ready to jump up and support you in any way they can. So we want to thank Shannon for his time, his wonderful thoughts, and his, his support and his wonderful works. It's been a pleasure, Shannon, and <laughs> <laughs> this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, pleasure's all mine. I, I really appreciate it. You've been very, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon.